Okay, my first slide here, it says, um, includes the following new proofs. <clears throat> and one thing that motivates me to want to come out and speak and have a ministry is that I have discovered some new ways of proving God's existence and the validity of the Bible and uh, ways that I don't see anybody else saying so you're going to hear those ways tonight <laughs> Okay, so one's the scientific proof that God exists and that the Bible is true. And when I say science, it's not like, um, like it says in uh, Timothy, uh, science so-called. This is real science. It's amazing that there are uh, some recent discoveries made by uh, Nobel Prize winning scientist that backs the Bible and we're going to get into that. Also I developed a system on how to prove what is true and I call it truth phobia but you'll, you'll see what that means. In other words it's an acronym phobia F-O-B-I-A that you can't absolutely say you've proven something if you're basing your proof on feelings, opinions, beliefs, intellectualizing, or authorities. What you can uh, proof with is uh, actual science, and so we're going to get into that. Okay, so this is first a little bit about me and how I came to these conclusions. Uh, Augustine, the 5th century bishop of Hippo, says, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds rest in thee. Well, I had a restless heart and a restless mind. Uh, just coming up through life, I wasn't satisfied. I needed, there's something more that I needed to know. I didn't know what it was, though, that I needed to know, but I kept searching. And I ended up searching through 20 approaches to lifestyle and truth. And I had an uh, engineer's degree of scrutiny. I, I was trained in engineering. Uh, no stone unturned in this search. But I never found the answer right off the bat. So here's the, tw <laughs> here's the 20 things that I did to try to find it. And these are the things that were really popular um, in San Francisco. I grew up in San Francisco. That's part of the problem. And, uh, you know, why, in other words, why couldn't I find a proof of the Bible is critical. I always think about that. You know, people say, well, uh, you know, is intellectual, is that important? I say it's critical. Because, how else could we come to know and understand God or life? Except through the observable specifics of creation and personally through the Holy Spirit. But even the Bible is needed to validate the messages of the Holy Spirit as being a from God reality. Otherwise, people just believe in and make stuff up. And them all being correct is not logically possible. And there are many different beliefs in the world that are believed by many millions. Therefore, proof is needed. Which one is right? Well, it, you know, if you really boil it down, it's going to turn out that the Bible is provable. Uh, so finally, the many year search was solved with the 20th approach, Jesus in the Bible, which has lasted since 1983. So why did it take so long? Like I said, it took place in San Francisco. Okay, so I was so excited and inspired by that realization and the peace that was infused into my heart as a result of making Jesus the head of my life and accepting the Bible as truth that I devoted my life to evangelism. I had an urge to share. That has resulted in eight books, eight DVDs, many speeches, all inspired by the Holy Spirit and all to spread the good news that is available to everyone. My response was like the men in these two verses. Matthew 13, 44 to 46. 
Again, the kingdom of heaven is like the treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. When he found one really valuable pearl, he went back and, and put up for sale all that he had and bought it. So, you know, that's, you know, you know we go through life and then we uh, try things and we find certain things and some things are more important than others. And this is what this guy found. It's also what I found. When I finally came to, the, uh, to Jesus as being the head of my life, something changed inside of me. I mean, it, it was uh, peace that I didn't have before. The restless heart was restless no more. This presentation today is my latest attempt to spread the truth of God, which is that field and pearl. When you find something that's, that's really, really valuable, then uh, it's easy to submit to it. This was a divine appointment for me. Uh, I fell asleep one night with the television on. And it was on a, a channel where a program came on that was uh, Everybody Loves Raymond. I don't know if you've seen that program. and. You know, I just saw something that was like, oh, wow. You know, I mean, we have this attitude about, you know, secular TV and how it just doesn't touch God or the issues of God. But where do you see this? This is really inspiring. Allie? Hey. Hi, Daddy. Hi. What you doing? Just playing with my dolls. Oh, good. Good. Listen, um, the other day you, you asked questions about babies and stuff. When you started sneezing? <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, anyway, I was wondering if you wanted to talk about that now. Okay. <sighs> Good. Good. <laughs> okay. Let me try to explain a few things. <laughs> Okay, here's what happens. When a man and a woman love each other very much, they get married. And then sometimes they decide to make a baby. Why are there babies? Right, right. Okay, I'm gonna get to that. Okay. What a man and a woman do is... No, I mean, I know that the man and the woman have to do something, but... Why are we born? Why has God put us here? <laughs> because that's what? If we all go to heaven when we die, then why does God want us here first? <laughs> um, why does God want us here? Yeah, why? Yeah, I heard you. I heard you. <laughs> you don't want to talk about sex? <laughs> okay, you really want to know why God wants us here first? That's a good question. You see, God is up in heaven, and, well, honey, it's very crowded up there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, 
And, and you don't want to be in heaven if it's crowded, right? I mean, remember when we went to Disney World, how crowded that was? Huh? I mean, it was fun, but it was too crowded, right? So God, he sends us down to earth for a little while to ease the heavenly congestion. I don't want you to... I'll be back in a minute. Hey, what are you doing? You were only up there like... I got blindsided! What? What do you mean? I don't even want to talk about sex. She started asking questions about life. Why did God put us here? Crazy stuff like that. Wow, so what did you say? I told her we're here because heaven is crowded. You said heaven is crowded? I got ambushed! Oh my God, wait, you gotta get back up there. No, you go, you go up there. No, you're the one that wants to prove he's mature. Oh, why can't you have this discussion with your daughter? Because I studied for the sex one. I wasn't ready for this. I don't just have a switch that can make me smart. No kidding. I mean, come on, you, you couldn't come up with anything? Just tell her we're put on Earth to, you know, because... Well, look at here, yeah, yeah, little Miss Smarty Pants. Look, it turns out Allie doesn't want to know how we get here. She wants to know why we're here, why God put us on Earth. And she's waiting for Ray to answer her. Listen to me. Here's what life is. You're born, you go to school, you go to work, you die. That's it. That's all? Listen, we're not talking about what we do while we're here, Dad. Yeah, yeah, the big question is why we're here in the first place. You know, I've spent many a night lying in bed thinking about this kind of stuff. Life's imponderables. <laughs> Where are we? Where are we in the big scheme of things? I think Allie's too young to be worrying about things like this. No, I'm proud of her. I love it that she's such an independent thinker. If she's so independent, why can't she figure this out herself? <laughs> Listen, just get up there and tell her that God put us on Earth to help each other. It's simple, it's direct, it's a good way for her to live her life. What are you talking about? That doesn't answer anything. What, what are you telling me that God said, hmm, Earth, let's see, what should I put there? Hmm. Oh, I know. It's all in the Bible. You ever think about space? <laughs> what is it? Is it really endless? I mean, if you had a spaceship, could you go flying and flying through space forever? Why don't you give it a shot? No, I'm not kidding around here. I mean, how could space go on forever? And if it doesn't, then what's at the end, huh? Stop it, Robbie. You'll give yourself a tummy ache. What about the beginning of time? What was it before that? Before time? Nothing? I mean, what is nothing? How could there be nothing? This doesn't bother anybody else? <laughs> Religious scholars spend their entire lives trying to answer this question. You're not just going to flip through the Bible and find the meaning of life. Oh, ye of little faith. <laughs> That's in here somewhere, too. Look, if you want to know what's in the Bible, why don't you talk to Father Hubley? Hey, that's right. You know what? It's his job to know these things. What, are you going to call him? Yeah. What are we putting the money in that basket for? <laughs> oh, uh, it's, his, it's his machine. Hey, Father Hubbley, hi, it's Raymond Barone. Ask him about space. What's at the end? What's out there? Oh, will you stop it? What's out there? <laughs> anyway, me and the family were just sitting around and we had a quick question for you. What is the meaning of life? <laughs> so if you could get back to us as soon as possible, we'd appreciate it, right? Uh, we're kind of waiting. Okay, thank you. Goodbye. God bless you. <laughs> and us and the meek. Do you know the fruit fly only lives one day? <laughs> huh? Well, what, you okay there? What, one day. What's his meaning of life, huh? Maybe there's no meaning of life for any one of us. I mean, really. Am I any different than the fruit fly? <laughs> The fruit fly doesn't question why he's here. That's what makes us different. 
I don't know, maybe that's kind of the meaning of life. Never knowing the answer, but always wondering about it. So, so God made it smart enough to know that there's an answer, but not smart enough to figure it out? Come on! <laughs> Look, what am I gonna tell Allie, huh? She's waiting now. Tell her to come down here. I'll set her straight. No more of this nonsense. It's not nonsense, Frank. Haven't you ever heard that the unexamined life is not worth living? Hey, you know what? <laughs> See, see that's your problem, Frank. You're so close-minded. No, the problem is you're so open-mouthed. <laughs> No, she's right, Frank. Maybe if you let yourself be a little more open-minded and let yourself think about some of these things, life might be better here for all of us. Okay, great. You got answers for everybody except your own daughter. What? Hey, you heard him. It's me and him against all three. No, it's not, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying we should be focusing on what to tell Allie right now. How would you answer her question? So, close your eyes for 30 seconds and see what you would say to her. Imagine what you would say to her. How would you answer her question? Why God put, put us here first? Okay, now um, I'm going to get into that thing that I said determines the truth. This acronym that I came up with that says that truth can't absolutely be determined by feelings, opinions, beliefs, intellectualizing, or authorities. Yet it often is. As a matter of fact, if you ask somebody what the truth is, they'll usually rely on one of those things to prove it. But it doesn't prove it. So then what does prove it? Okay. Uh, so now, what would you say to the girl, given, given that? Do you have an answer that doesn't violate any of these things? Anybody? Yes? Well, I grew up on a farm, and on a farm you learn a lot of things which doesn't need much explanation from an adult. <laughs> I mean, nature. Part of the problem is that we live in a world that doesn't believe in this stuff. It diverts its attention to many things, but not to the ultimate solution, which is God. So that's, that's why I'm doing what I do, is to try to convince that, yeah, this is important, and there is an answer. So, anybody else? Well, when originally when we put the song here in the garden, it was that Satan corrupted that, and now he has to let this plan play out so that we have free will. And God got kind of put in a pickle. He could have ended it in heaven when Satan rebelled. But he had to let it play out so that he, every, all the other angels, we would all know that God is just. Right. And uh, we're going to, the last slide here, I'm going to incorporate that into how I would answer the girl. The question, because we are here. So, God obviously has a reason. Okay, my conclusion is only science-backed answers would qualify as fully verifiable. But that wouldn't include any, just anything that is presented in the name of science. 1 Timothy 6.20 O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called. That's why part of my mission is to set the record straight as to what true science is. I mean, like I said earlier, 
there are a lot of explanations in this world as to what this life is all about, where it came from, you know, but they're usually based on the truth phobia. And, but there is, there is a way to prove it. So the next question is, can legitimate science prove the existence of God and the credibility of the Bible? The answer is yes. Here is the proof for the existence of God. The first law of thermodynamics includes that the physical universe had to be created by something non-physical. They leave that out for some strange reason. It's, in other words, if the first law of thermodynamics which says that nothing physical can create new physicality, well then what is it, what's the conclusion, what's the obvious conclusion? That everything had to come from something non-physical. I don't know why they just don't say that, but that would mean they'd have to accept God. And then the attributes of this non-physical creator are that it is a powerful, intelligent, eternal being. And each one of those things are provable, who God is. He's a non-physical, powerful, intelligent, eternal being. And I, I have all of that in um, that proof, because this, it would be a long time to do it tonight, in, uh, in DVDs that I've made of TV shows that are on that table over there. Okay, so what about proof of the Bible? So that, that's all, I also have a, a, a DVD over there that does this, and I've written books about it. These are ten proofs that prove the Bible. I can do one of them tonight. And it would come under the category of microscience, proof number eight. Okay, so there's a common theme out in the world that the universe is a billion years old. But then the Bible says it's 6,000 years old. Wait a minute, how do you reconcile that? Which one's right? Well, I'll show you how I reconciled it. And I reconciled it with modern science, modern secular Nobel Prize winning science. This is, these are new things that most people don't realize or know about. And basically it says that, see, the billion years is based on um, V is equal to X over T. And uh, where V, the velocity, the ultimate velocity is the speed of light. That's the ultimate speed. Recently they figured out that at the Big Bang, the universe exploded so fast, it's just like the Bible says, it happened in one day. The universe was created in one day. And then the next six days, uh, God developed um, Earth and, and that's all in the Bible too. But, uh, you know, they, they didn't, they were stuck on that. They were stuck on thinking because the speed of light is not the ultimate speed limit. And that's what they had to discover, and that's been discovered in, in the past few years. And then there's all these other proofs. Uh, when I've gotten into my, um, I have a book called The Proof That God Exists and the Bible is True. And a, a DVD also too, number three over there, that gets into each one of these things and shows how the Bible proves superior on each one of them. Science, history, prophecy, supernatural, psychology, sociology, inerrancy, microscience, logic, and it's the only provable inerrant complete system. Like those 20 things that I showed earlier that I did, I got into each one of them hoping that they were going to have the answer. But they all, they all came at, at some point that they didn't have the answer and I had to move on. 
and I kept moving on, kept moving on, until I actually moved to Los Angeles, and uh, you know, found the Bible there. And when I finally decided that um, to do what the Bible says, uh, that give Jesus a try, I tried everything else. And when I gave Jesus a try, the restlessness in my heart went away. And it was, uh, it was amazing. And that's why that was so valuable to me that I felt like I, I had to tell people about it. I had to write books, and I, I, I've written many books. Matter of fact, ever since that day in 1983, this is all I think about. This is, this is my main uh, thing in life, is to write the books and to witness and to speak. And so, that's all I can do <laughs> while I'm here, you know. Okay, so how would I answer the girl's question? Okay, number one, we don't all go to heaven when we die. She said, why does, you know, everybody go to heaven? There are mainly good and bad people, and God only wants good in his, wor in his world. But God gave people free will to choose which one they would be. The main part of being good is to love God and value and obey His ways. But many people ignore God in His ways. That's so true in this world. Many, many, many people ignore God in His ways. So, God has us here to find out who would be devoted to being good. And only people who value being all good on God's terms will be in heaven. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a heaven. And that's it. That's my uh, website there if you want to see where my books and stuff like that go. But, yeah, so that's it. Yeah, thank you. Here we go. All right, so... Uh your, your materials are all about proving the truth of God to, to those who do not believe in God, right? Right, and it's also to, re to enforce uh, believers, too. Yeah, to, to, to support our faith as well, for, you know, to, to help us in our own faith. What I was wondering, um, you know, you asked the question, you know, what would we say to the girl, and what would you say, and, and what are we based it can't be based on uh, the FOBIA. But I, my question is, um, aren't we basing our answers on beliefs and authorities, authorities being the Bible, beliefs being faith in God, when we, when we answer in the way that you presented at the end? Right. Well, authorities, you know, like uh, the Bible being our ultimate authority, first, that has to be proven. That's why one of my main things is to prove the credibility of the Bible. I mean, we can't just say, oh yeah, the Bible is it. The Bible is the ultimate authority. Uh, oh, okay. Because, because we're, you know, we're dealing with the world. See, and we're dealing... So when we engage somebody in the secular sphere, we can't just say the Bible says dot, dot, dot. That's not going to win them over the truth until we have um, gotten them to the point where they are accepting the Bible. Exactly. Okay. And, and they, they, they realize that it's the truth. Yeah. And that's when we can talk about our beliefs and our authorities and, and how we have experienced God as a testimony to, to what He has done. And, and uh, we can point to the Bible as the authority once, once they are there, once we lead them to, to there, using the proofs of science and, and logic and reasoning and um, pointing out the, the fallacies of popular science and things like that. Is that, is that how I'm understanding? Yeah. yeah. In other words, uh, how do we know that that's true? I mean, because we have the Bible, but there are many religions that have many Bibles, their own scriptures. 
So why are they true? Or why are we true? See, it, that, then it comes down to proof. And most people don't... Um, they just fall into like whatever they grew up with. Uh, but do they really have a solid feeling about it? I mean, um, for me, I, I see because of my engineering, uh, I, 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 you have to, engineers leave no stone unturned, and you have to um, you have to question everything, and so. That's what I would do when I first became a Christian. Or I, first of all, when, it, when that change happened in my heart, you know, I got all excited, you know. And maybe that happens for a lot of people. But, but then my engineering side came in, and, and I would have all these what I call whatabouts. Oh, well, what about the people on Fiji Islands who never heard, blah, blah, blah. blah. And so um, I had to answer those or get answers for those over the years and uh, that's because I've done that there are no more whatabouts now and I just have a solid peace in my heart and my mind and that's worth it <laughs> who says that Earth, universe, Earth is 16 million, million, years old. Just about all, sci all scientists. How do they, how do, where do they base that? Um, they base it on the speed of light, the, the, that formula that I said, mm -hmm. velocity is equal to distance over time. So what they do is they measure the distance and then they, uh, they know that, that the velocity is constant, there's an ultimate well, you know, velocity, I don't know why they don't talk about the change up to that point. And then they say, then they figure out the T, the time. But in, in Genesis, it said the world was void. It didn't say it wasn't there. You know, it was shaped in God molded. Who knows how long it had been, whatever it was before that. Um, well, let's see. There, there have been people who have gone back to... Uh, the beginning of people. I mean, if God's ultimate reason for making all this was, I mean, you know, heaven didn't kind of work out in, in one way. It, it didn't work out perfectly with the, uh, with the angels, the fallen angels. So he went right into making people. And so if you go through genealogy, it comes out to be 6,000 years. Right, time, it is time stamp. I was just wondering, because carbon dating only goes back, that's less than 6,000 years. They right. They don't go back any farther. Right. No matter what they say, that's the fact. Right. That's true. You have to go to selenium dating after that. That takes you back further. But it doesn't matter because, I mean, that's, that's another thing. Uh, uh, another one of the DVDs that I've done is about evolution and how that's a fantasy, how it's based on bad science. I mean, just a, a simple one is um, the Grand Canyon. Okay, so they say, okay, Grand Canyon took millions of years to happen. Well, Mount St. Helens did a little mini Grand Canyon, did the same thing with the uh, strata and all that. Same as Grand Canyon, but in 48 hours. And so it didn't take all that time. What was it that made you turn the corner into to faith in God? What, the, not, not the entire history, but what was the, your kind of defining moment when, when you began to believe in, in the Lord and in Jesus? Okay, well, like I said, I moved to Los Angeles, yeah. and my family, uh, my, my cousin, Jerry, he, um, he's a writer and a producer for, like, Michael Jackson and Diana Ross, and so... 
they started going to uh, Dr. John MacArthur's church. And they're, so they're trying to convince me at the time that uh, the Bible is it. You know, and I go, oh, well, you know, I, I come from a new age perspective. I didn't need, I don't need Jesus. I don't need, you know, you know. And then finally, at one point, I just said, wait a minute, none of this other stuff's working. Why don't I give Jesus a shot? Like of what they're saying. So there was one day, just one day I was walking down the street thinking about this, and I looked up to the sky and I said, Jesus, I'm giving you a try now. You know, and when I did that, my insides changed. <laughs> that was proof enough for me, you know. Whereas all those other things never had the power. You know, Scientology, uh, gurus, none of that had the power to take away the restlessness in my heart. So that was the moment. And then I got so excited that I started going to that, their church, you know, like every Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday. And uh, just, and it's all Bible based. So I was just being exposed to what's in the Bible. And there was, you know, um, uh, my, like I said, my cousin, I went over to their house one time. I was living with this woman, and so they, and her name was Jane, and they says, so how's it going with Jane? And I said, uh, oh, she's nagging me all the time. You know, it's like, keep the closet door shut all the time, or keep the closet door open all the time. I couldn't keep up with her. So the wife got up and left the room. And when she got up and left the room, I said, oh, uh, she's disgusted by my complaining. But then she came back in from the room, into the room, with an open Bible. And it was open to Proverbs. And it says, she says, read this. And it says, it's better to live on the edge of a roof than to live with a nagging woman. <laughs> I says, wow, you know, that makes sense, you know, <laughs> you know, there's, there's one more thing that, you know, that the Bible now makes more sense than anything I've ever done, it's all the psychology, you know, all the, all the other kinds of things, of the 20 things that I've done. So, that started melting me away, and then it said, a couple of other phrases came out of the Bible that didn't come out of the hippie era that I come from. It says, God hates sin. And I thought about it, you know, I thought about all the broken relationships in the communities that I was in, and I go, yeah, I hate sin too. I do. I, I admit it to myself now. I hate, I hate sin. So, that started breaking me down, and then there was the, the moment. And <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Diane? There's still a job problem. John Parker's church to the Adventist church. What? Oh, yeah, okay, sure. Okay, so. Um, like I said, I have the, the whatabouts. Well, I would study the Bible. I mean, to me, it's like, it, it, you know, I, John MacArthur wasn't my guru, and uh, or nothing out there was. I listened to these people, you know, Dr. Charles Stanley and all these people, and get something out of it. But still, it wasn't the ultimate truth. The Bible was the ultimate truth. And so, um, so I, so I started reading the Bible, and I go, wait a minute. The Bible says that there's no hell. There's no eternal hell. And I go, well, all these people are saying there is an eternal hell. And so I, I said, wait a minute. I, ju I just had to carry that with me for years. Until I finally came to the Adventist church. And they said, yeah, you're right, there is no eternal hell. And I go, oh, okay, good. <laughs>
Yeah, that doctrine of hell is, is a major one. There's so much at stake there with the character of God and hope for the future. And when, when you go by what the Bible says, it makes logical sense. Quote Jesus on it. Yeah. You know? Um, and, and, you know, and just logical, too. I mean, why would, why would a loving God want to put anybody for eternity into a, a, a torture place? That doesn't make sense. So, there's, <laughs> there's so many things, you know, in the world that don't make sense. And yet the world is so distracted away from something that's so awesome which is the Bible. I really appreciate uh, what you bring out, Dennis. Uh, and I've been thinking about the question, what would I say to the girl? Mm. And trying to separate in my mind what comes from verifiable facts and what is the basis of my religious, uh, my belief system, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure I've sorted it all out yet, but the, the two things that I would make sure that, uh, that I started with, with the girl is that God is the all-powerful creator, and you've shown scientific evidence of that, and then that God is, love, is a loving God absolutely loving God and then that because he's the, the creator he creates us but he wants us to also be loving and he gives us this opportunity in this world to develop our characters by his grace and power so that we reflect his likeness and those are the kind of people he wants in heaven. Now that's kind of the outside construct yeah, um, I think the important uh, element there is, um, though, are you believing in this God, or do you know for sure? That, can you prove? So that's what it boils down to for me all, on everything. Is there proof that God exists and God is a loving God? And it's, it all boils down to the, the Bible being proven to be true. And I think from listening to you, it, it sounds like a, a genesis part of that, a beginning part of that for you was saying, Jesus, I'm going to give you a chance. And the, the feeling of confidence and uh, relief that came to you. Uh, so there, there are feelings involved that uh, sort of motivated you to look deeper and see if this is really rock solid. And where did those feelings come from? Yeah. God. Yeah. You know. God, the loving creator. Right? Yeah, he planted those feelings in, in me. That, that's one of the things I was, we talked about this, uh, this morning, um, where I write a lot of books. And when I write, I do my writing of books and articles and stuff, I'm always looking to right here for thumbs up or thumbs down. And so um, it's like, it, that's when I say it in truth will be intellectualizing. We can't just re, you know, relegate this to intellectualizing. We have to say, wait a minute, there is a, a, a proof inside of us you know, a green light that we get, and living but living through that green light is good. <laughs> the, uh, the clip you showed certainly showed the inadequacy of, of intellectualizing. Right. Exactly. Right. Because they just they were just sitting around trying to figure it out. You know, well, what good is that? Do you want the truth, or do you want to? It's people figuring it out. Because people figuring it out, you've got a whole world full of people figuring it out. And, but look at the fruit of the, the society and people and divorce and, you know, crime and... Thank you. 
sure. Thank you. What? Yeah, at least one woman had enough sense to go and pull down the Bible. Oh, yeah. Right, yeah. That was awesome. Yeah, that was awesome. You know, to show how much intelligence there was there. And wisdom. Dennis, is archaeology one of your proofs? Uh, yeah, there are archaeological proofs, yeah. Yeah. Was that in your list of ten? Yeah, it's, it's under, um, I think I've put it with history. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, in the history. And, and what was number 10? Um, that this was the only uh, provable system, completely provable system in the world. In other words, okay, if we start comparing the Bible, you know, Zoroastrian, you know, whatever. Uh, do these systems, and I, and like I did when I was doing the 20 things, um, I would get, I get into it at, at first, you know, just all excited. Oh, new community, uh, answers. But then once you get in there a while, you, then the what about start happening. And I go, wait a minute, you know, this is saying one thing, but it doesn't make sense. So that means I got to move on to the next thing. And I kept moving on until I hit the where there's no more moving on, which is the Bible and Jesus. Any other questions? Lily? <laughs> I understand that, that you could go into detail on all those things. Right. But we would be here probably for months. Right? Yeah, I've, <laughs> that's true. I, well, I've given uh, speeches mm -hmm. on uh, the proof of God, for one. That, that's a three-hour speech, yeah. you know. And then the proof of the Bible, it's another three-hour speech. That's why I, I have those DVDs, and I have books that I've written that break it all down. Thank you for sharing your testimony with us and your journey and uh, your materials and, and you've given us an introduction to the concepts of, of how we can engage people uh, in the secular sphere and lead them to understand God and lead them to consider God. Yeah, just, uh, one way of doing that is just ask them, you know, uh, how do they feel about that? How do they feel about God? What, what do they think is the truth? You know, and then everybody's got an answer. Everybody's given this some thought. But is this the thought that they've come up with bring them peace? Does it bring the world peace? You know, because there's a lot of crazy things that people believe and think, and it doesn't bring peace. And peace is what has to be the end result. Oh yeah. Physical, physical right, non-physical creator. Yeah. The, okay, first law of thermodynamics says that energy cannot be created nor destroyed. Okay, that's that that's a, a solid science principle accepted by all scientists. So why not take that a step further? If energy cannot be created, what they're really saying is energy cannot be created by something else that's physical. That's why when people, you know, come up with um, aliens, you know, 
I go, well, what good is that? Because somebody had to make the aliens. And so, you're still stuck with the same problem. Where did everything originate from? And it had to be originated from something non-physical. Yeah, about everything. There had to be a God. Right. And, and, but he was physical. Huh? Was he physical? No. No. The, the creator of the world wasn't physical. There was no physical. He created physical. And he's not physical now. Well, the Bible says that God is a spirit. Right. And but but yet he himself can take on physicality and, and, and we see that happening. Right. And we also see him existing um, in time as well as being able to be transcendent of it. Um, so there are there are elements to which God can himself be physical, but the Bible says that he is above and beyond all of that. And God is a spirit, as, as it says. Yeah, and he's a different kind of physical. He's uh, like, like Jesus on the road to Emmaus. You know, they didn't recognize him. So obviously he was able to disguise himself. And so... Uh, or something, or they were blind. Yeah. yeah. So God, God, who made physical, can be physical, can inhabit physicality. But um, there need, needed to be a non-physical creator to begin everything with, and that's the the uh, thermodynamics law, the first law of thermodynamics. Another example of the uh, physical versus the spiritual is Jesus. After his resurrection, he would appear, and suddenly he'd be gone. He'd just Right. They, they were there all of a sudden he's standing in the midst of them. And right. he's here handle me. Right. But there's a physicality beyond what we realize. Right. And he even ate fish. <laughs> yeah. So he's obviously he created physicality, so he's in control of the whole thing. And he, he created it as a blessing to us. And, and that will be the case on the new earth, too. Be, well, we'll be there. Uh, here's, <laughs> here's something that I've come up with recently. Um, when I think about marriage, and oh, when I, sorry. When I think about marriage and families, I think about, I had this thought recently that Men and women are the same spirit, God breathed the spirit. And the proof of that is that in heaven there will be no marriage, no given to marriage. So, so therefore, men and women are the same spirit, essence spirit, God breathed spirit. But they won't uh, they won't need that in heaven. They'll be the same. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. The only difference between a man and a woman is the inhabiting different kind of body. And then each body has its own requirements and you know, and God judges each person based on those requirements. <laughs> Dennis, we're about at the close of time. Would you be willing to pray for us? Sure. Lord, you've made this awesome life. Awesome creation, awesome invention on your part. And human beings kind of messed up along the way. But we all have the restless heart and we all seek you. And so we pray that our, us in our lives can help people 
meet that and experience that and that you can use us to help that happen because like James said faith without works is dead so we don't want to have dead faith we want to be active in ministry and so we we pray that you inspire us to fulfill that in your purpose for people. Amen. Thank you. It's my pleasure. My pleasure.